Today I start with good old comrade Lenin, who uh, wrote a pamphlet called, uh, titled One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, which has quite often been remembered as two steps forward and one step back. Of course, one step forward and two steps back is, is obviously not moving forward at all. Um, we will move forward. But what, what I mean by that is that I'm going to pick up on some of the things we talked about yesterday and then try and move the discussion uh, into the areas advertised. Um, and I only have half an hour, so I will try to be very quick and efficient and give full value for money, as uh, the phrase is. Well, in just, just reading newspapers over the last uh, couple of weeks, I and knowing I was coming here, then I suddenly find these, uh, these extracts from things that I read, and I thought, well, that's very interesting because it's very clear that, that the problems that we face, oh, sorry, I knew I, knew I would forget to press the second button. The problem is not only, the problem that Africa faces is clearly not just Africa. These two countries are not African countries. And um, so the first one, the problem with industrial production, not only do we import nearly all of our capital goods and consumer durables, but balance of trade is in deficit in energy, medicine, textiles, consumer electronics, and even agriculture. So anybody guess where that is? Somewhere in Europe, yes. Well. Not to, not to take too much time over this, th that's Greece. Um, that's Greece. And Le Monde Diplomatique uh, is an excellent, excellent, excellent review, um, which I can recommend to everybody. Um, and the second country, under two out of every three components of cars supposedly made in this country actually come from abroad. Uh, indeed, the UK. Um, there aren't any prizes for this quiz, by the way. <laughs> and even where you have got industrialized, now again, I, I'm just reading um, the, the press, and I come across this particular piece about East Africa. Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm going to do this a lot, because I'm old. Um, I'm over 40. Um, and, and, and even where you have got industrialization, you've got all kinds of competitive pressures. And here we have the East African textile industry threatened by charity, threatened by the import of second-hand clothes, which are normally given to charities to help the, uh, to help the poor um, in, in the developing world. And so here we have that threat to a to textile industry. So even where you have industry, there are problems. And of course, that raises the wider question of protectionism and, and how to develop industry. Um, so that, I want to talk about that. And then why has manufacturing industrialization been so slow to develop and affect structural transformation? And can structural transformation through manufacturing generate sufficient employment for the growing for the growing labor force, and especially growing urban labor force. And so those are, are the questions that, I, that I, I want to look at in a bit more detail. So how was structural transformation meant to happen? And the usual story that, and this is now is going back to the 60s, and the early uh, independence economic policies, and the kind of general view in the economics profession, in the development economics profession, was, well, you've got to industrialize. And remember Caldor from yesterday. You've got to industrialize. And the first, the, 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 the strategy has to be one of import substitution. So you look at what you're importing, and, that, and you produce those things yourself. And in order to do that, you have to protect yourself for imports of competitive, of, of competitive goods until you have an efficient um, 
the manufacturing sector that can compete with imports. So that was, uh, that was structural adjustment. That was, sorry, uh, import substitution. And, um, and, you, and, and that import substitution is about, first of all, you've got agriculture, you've got agricultural products, you've got primary products which dominate the economy. So process the primary products. Um, process, the text, process the cotton into textiles, process the coffee and tea into the finished product, etc., etc. And then as far as manufacturing industry is concerned, other aspects of manufacturing industry, last stage manufacturing. Import all the capital goods and, and then assemble, last stage assembly, produce the consumer goods. Um, and so that was, that was the... Uh, that was the strategy. And the idea was that you would maximize the linkages between, between the, um, the different sectors. Um, you would mobilize domestic savings and investment. And, and, and there were kind of two models that were, were available in, in, in some sense. One was the Soviet model and the other was the Chinese model. And I worked, my first job was, was in Tanzania, and I, I worked uh, particularly uh, on, on these two issues of, of which was more appropriate for the Tanzanian economy at that particular time, the, the Soviet or the Chinese, the Soviet or the Chinese models. But both of them were models of rapid manufacturing industrialization. Okay. And then there was the question of who's, who was going to do this? There were, and and, and the, as we heard yesterday, the state was going to be the only actor really available. And the, t the private sector wasn't, wasn't big enough. Um, and the two approaches were to attract foreign investment with tax and other, other incentives, bring the foreign investors in, and let them get on with it. So that was one approach. And the other approach was well, yes, we need foreign, we obviously need foreign investment, but we need, this has to be under the control of the state. So we have to have it under national control. So we'll have foreign investors, we'll have them in as partners, we'll have them in as helping to run our enterprises, but they will be our enterprises and they will be state-owned enterprises. And that was, that was roughly what happened in countries like Tanzania. To make this work, you, you need a, a, a skilled labor force. You needed to have a skilled labor force, and ideally a prior, a prior skilled labor force. And then you need, you need, having got that labor force and having got that, uh, the, 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 the industries established, then there is a process of learning by doing. Uh, the actual process of being involved in manufacturing is also a teacher. That therefore needs education. And of course, the problem is that you have your manufacturing before you've got your skilled labor force. So you, you have to import that skilled labor force. You have to import the managers. You have to import the technicians. But eventually, you train your own. That's the idea. And the result of all of this is that you have employment creation. So that, that was the kind of general idea, that you would then get employment. And now, very recently, we have um, the work of, of UNIDO, as a recent publication of UNIDO, in which they lay everything out very straightforwardly. So this is how you get structural transformation. And here's a nice diagram, and I don't know whether you can see it all, but it doesn't really matter, because my, my point is really that here's the diagram. And the diagram is giving you all the linkages between the different bits and pieces. Um, and and you, have, you, know, you have things like location, and you have you know, a lot of technical issues supply of, of, of inputs and all of that. You've got all these linkages. And this looks absolutely wonderful on paper. And that's fine. So let's, you know, kind of embed that in your, in your minds because that's the way to do it. Okay. Um, and forget the other questions for a moment. And you need a, a, lot, a, set of, a set of key messages. I'm getting better at this now. A set of key messages. Um, but I've put in brackets, yes, but who makes the state do it? So the messages are achieve su sustained employment generation re requires industrial policies to focus on the structural transformation of the economy. And the state can promote industrial policy either as a regulator, financier, producer or consumer. 
It should oversee close coordination with other policies as they undermine the objectives of industrial policy, as they can undermine the objectives of industrial policy if they are misaligned, and so on and so on. I mean, this is almost a repeat of things that were written, been written every decade, really. So, technically, we know all about that. But then the political economy question is, who's going to do it? Who are the agents of change? There was brief reference to agency yesterday. Who are the agents of change? The state. But what is the state? And there'll be more discussion about that uh, later on in this, in this uh, workshop. Who, and, or is it classically, um, on, at least on, on, on the left propositions of this, the vanguard party allied with workers' organizations representing the interests of workers and peasants? Or is it Shivji's bureaucratic bourgeoisie? Um, that's going back some time, but this was very late 1960s, early 1970s characterization of the Tanzanian state as a bureaucratic bourgeoisie, uh, accumulating but bureaucratic. Or are we going to get a proto-accumulating capitalist class emerging from the small and medium enterprise sector, emerging from the informal sector? Informal sector actors becoming more and more formal in the sense of employing more people, of accumulating capital, and, and being the capitalist class in the, in, in the good old Marxist sense of, of, the, of, the, of the phrase. Now those questions of agents of change, uh, an agency, they, they're not avoided. I mean, they are kind of discussed, but in a very, very particular way, which is em embodied in, this, in, in ideas about good governance. Um, whatever that, I, I've, I've never understood what that means, really. Well, I do understand what it means, but, but what people mean by that is very different in different contexts. Um, but the agency, the question of agency, who's, who's going to do it? So, what's the African experience? Well, as we, I mean, just to sum, partly summarizing what we had yesterday and, and, and adding some things here, you could write a list of, the, of, 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 of main points of that experience. And I think, as was emphasized yesterday, initially there were very high rates of growth of manufacturing. Um, but, and there are lots of projects. But import, but, and the import substitution industrialization strategy generated increased imports of capital goods and very little export of the goods that were produced the, about the end products. Because, of course, they were not meant for the export market. They were meant to replace goods that were domestically consumed. But then, because the markets are small, you have very high costs of production. So for that reason, you had to prevent imports of competitor goods, and, for, and, and that made these consumer goods quite expensive. Then, another criti criticism of import substitution was that it wasn't planned. Essentially, governments had a plan, and that plan was essentially a shopping list of projects. But these projects were not necessarily linked with each other, and... Um, and so they were fairly, it was fairly random what you actually got and what you, what you got in the end. And then in the 1970s, we had the oil, uh, the two oil price rises, and we had, the, uh, we had droughts in many countries. The droughts meant having to import food. The oil crisis meant having to pay a lot more for oil imports. Balance of payments crises, and the consequence of that was um, an import squeeze and a shortage of spare parts, and um, a slow slowdown in the growth of, of, of manufacturing. And that slowdown in the growth of manufacturing was assisted by structural adjustment, uh, which was all about, about getting prices right, the prices of, uh, and all about free trade. The prices were too high, so of course um, the domestic firms had to compete with, with foreign imports, and those foreign imports were much more competitive and much more developed, and as a consequence, 
domestic industry had a whole lot of problems surviving and many didn't survive. So you have structural adjustment and you have deindustrialization as a consequence of that, particularly in the 80s and, um, and the earlier 90s. And then you get recovery in the 90s and 2000s, but that recovery is still bringing countries back to first stage processing and assembly. And there is still no capital goods sector. Uh, Marx's Department 1 that we heard about yesterday, the producer goods. So, so now some data, very quickly, um, just to make these, just to show that there is some evidence for some of the things I've just said. Um, we have in, in 19, and the, the, the numbers in brackets are the number of countries that, for which data is available at that time. And if you look at the structure of GDP, agriculture ranges from 11 to 95 percent. Now, again, we talk about common characteristics. What's quite interesting in, in the context, everybody treats Africa as a single entity. And of course, there is a huge variation. Um, but if you look at the medians, if you look at the middle, the middle country is 40, let's say in, in 62, the middle country is 43 percent. That means that half of the countries are below 43% and half are above between 43 and 95. So what you can say is that that 43 is much closer to, um, much closer to where, where, where countries are, or that's much more typical. Then in 2011, that's the latest data. It's interesting how this data comes so late, um, even at the World Bank. 2011, the range is 1 to 58 percent, so that range has narrowed, and the median has gone down to 23 percent. So there's been a decline in agriculture as a proportion of GDP. Industry has gone the other way. Um, now, industry includes manufacturing and, as we heard yesterday, mining and other kinds of activities, uh, construction and so on. It's not just manufacturing. And industry over GDP has has gone has gone the other way services has gone much more the other way um, and the range has, in, has the range has increased uh, 20 to 62 20 to 84 so you can see that and also there are many more countries that's the other point to make so it's not quite comparing like with like there are many more countries for which there is for which there is data okay and then we're interested in manufacturing and if we look at manufacturing and just to make, emphasize the point that was made yesterday, it goes 3% uh, to 23% in 1970, 2 to 42% in, uh, in, in 2011, having been 4 to 37% in 1990. So in 1990, there was more manufacturing as a proportion of GDP than, than in uh, 2011. And the, and the medians also tell the same kind of story. You go 9% to 10% to 7%. Now, one of the things that wasn't, we didn't talk about yesterday was the structure of manufacturing. And this is our capital goods, consumer goods, intermediate goods story. So there is a category in the data which has always existed called machinery and transport equipment. And that covers mostly what we would call capital goods or Marx's department one. 1970, the range was less than 1% to 13% with a, with a median of 4%. And in 2010, and you notice for the, the number of countries reporting is lower. That's an interesting statistic. In 2010, the range is 1 to 19 with a median of 2%. So it's shifting even lower than it was. Um, that distribution is even lower than it was before. Now, the, the thing to compare it with is then food and Food, beverages, and tobacco. And food, beverages, and tobacco ranges in 1970 from 15 to 88%, and median 37. And look, 2010, we're back there. We're in exactly the, almost the same place. Uh, the lower end is lower, but the higher end is much the same, and the median is much the same. So, so again, that emphasizes the fact that the, the, the recovery in manufacturing has been in this kind of area but we're still waiting for a big surge 
a big change in structure, and that's, I think, one of the things that I would characterize as part of structural tr transformation is a change in the structure of manufacturing itself, a move towards manufacturing machines that produce machines that produce final goods. Oh, you have five minutes? I have five minutes, okay. So that's that. And then I've got some stuff on, on growth. Um, it looks very respectable, but it hides the fact that what you had was a period of growth followed by a period of decline and then followed by a period of recovery. And so, <laughs> sorry, so you get, um, so you get, uh, um, uh, you know, it's a very simplified picture here. But essentially there has been some growth, but the growth, the big growth has been in services. And again, we heard, we heard that yesterday. Um, and then more structure, just to summarize the, these figures, I won't throw too many more at you, that um, uh, African countries are exporters, uh, don't ex are importers of, of manufacturers and are um, are, are in, are, sorry, are importers of manufacturers in particular um, and heavy importers of, uh, um, of, of goods in general relatively to GDP. So the very open economies with trade being a very important part of that but, all, but the imports of manufacturers being a very important part of, of, of total imports. And exports um, of manufacturers being exactly the, 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 the other way. Some of those high figures are a bit misleading because they tend to be exports of processed, of first stage processed primary products. Um, so they're not really, they're not really manufacturers, manufacturers in the sense of, of final goods manufacturers. Um, so let me, let me leave those aside now just to talk about employment for a moment. Um, again, if you look at the structure of employment, you have 25% median employed in agriculture, uh, which uh, produces 23% of GDP. You have 21% um, employed in industry. They don't give us the data for manufacturing, unfortunately. And you have um, that, that's a 7% of the labor force producing 21% of GDP at the medium. And services, you've got 47% of GDP produced by 36% of the labor force. So that's telling you essentially that manufacturing doesn't, doesn't uh, create all that many jobs it, uh, relatively to its importance in the economy. And again, we, we had uh, some, something of that yesterday. Now, there's a whole lot set of reasons, and I, I'll run through these very quickly, um, why that, that are given by the orthodoxy, the neoliberal orthodoxy tells you why structural transformation hasn't taken place. Uh, one is because of import substitution itself. Two is because of... Um, two, no, that's not right. One is because of import substitution. Of course, structural adjustment policies are, are not a neoliberal explanation. They are, they are a different explanation. Sorry, I've got this kind of mixed up here. Shouldn't be there. Um, they talk about the high cost of doing business. That's a real big factor, high cost of doing business. And they have data on this now. Uncompetitive wages and low skill levels. Credit and investment constraints. That Africa needs a proper financial sector. And we've all seen what having a proper financial sector has done to uh, recently to developed economies. Um, so you don't have enough banks, you don't have enough stock exchanges, you don't have enough uh, um, selling and buying of, uh, of very strange financial products. And then you would get much more mobilization of capital. A lack of export orientation and excessive public ownership and insufficient privatization. Um, and the effects of structural adjustment policies is something that, that I would say is, of course, they would never consider because they consider the effects of some structural adjustment policies to have been very beneficial. Now, I, I found this particular, this is a, from the same UNIDO report as the early one, one of the more interesting diagrams is, is where employment has gone. And if you 
want an explanation of why it hasn't come to Africa, it's because it's gone to Asia. But anyway, the most important thing is there's been this shift. Any growth in employment has taken place rapidly in Asia. So you can see how steep that left-hand set of bars is. And you can see Africa is on the far right, and you can see how shallow that, that increase is. And then other groups of countries, Europe and the United States, it's actually going down. So employment has shifted uh, in manufacturing, has shifted heavily towards East Asia. Okay. Um, now, I've only got, I think, minus a minute left. So let me quickly run through this because it's important. Um, there have, been, there have been some, thank you, there have been some moves towards the classic transformation. We've got rapid urbanization. So we've got availability of a large, free, with some links back to the countryside, obviously, but, but a generally relatively free labor force in the urban areas. Um, the continuing rural links are challenged by land grabs and all sorts of changes, again, in land tenure arrangements. Uh, we've got foreign investment in land and mineral extraction, but not in manufacturing. So the massive urban, massive increase in urban labor force is not being mopped up by a rapidly expanding manufacturing sector taking, taking advantage of this large supply of relatively cheap labor. But there are differences. Manu uh, manufacturing creates very many fewer jobs than it used to do. And that's very, very important. Jobs are created in new sectors, especially IT and things associated with IT services. Um, there are jobs created at higher levels, of financial services and, and all of that. But if we're looking for jobs for the mass of the population, these are not being created. There are a lot of low-wage jobs being created, uh, which follow on. And a lot of those end up quite often in the so-called informal sector. And the other big difference from classic, classical transformation is, is, I don't want to call it globalization, it's the global power of global capital. It's what uh, my friend John Saul calls the empire of capital. That you now have a new empire, it's the empire of capital. And capital that controls um, so many things and so many directions around the world. And is so powerful and is so concentrated. So can African economies follow the classical path? I think by now the answer is probably no. How much does this uh, depend on attracting foreign investment? And then if you attract foreign investment, who are you attracting? Who actually runs the world economy? And there is a, was a, I read a, a while back a fascinating piece of work by some Swiss researchers who had discovered that, done an analysis of corporate control and discovered that if they took the core of, the, of, of, of world capital, um, as they defined it, then 50 corporates effectively controlled, and most of them are financial corporates, banks, controlled 75% of core capital around the world. Uh, which, is, which is really uh, an evidence of concentration. We all know there's been concentration, but it's an evidence of real serious evidence of, of a really severe concentration. And then you have, you have the, the, the low wages story um, in the developed world. The low wages, the reserve army of migrants. Because we, uh, we talk about a migrant crisis in Europe, but what that is actually is, is hiding the fact that migration is very important uh, to keep the labor costs down and, um, and to uh, make available a cheap reserve army of, of, of labor for, for Europe. And, and the, uh, an issue that's not so new, but Samir Amin has raised it so many times that, and has written about it, is the whole story of delinking. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday, the question of really what is the, is the future for Africa lying in its uh, ever closer links with the rest of the world, or is there a, is there a case for delinking, which doesn't mean cutting off, it means being very careful about the links that are actually made and delinking some of them. And then there's the question of industrial strategy. Well, we'll probably come back to that in discussion. I'm now, I'm, 
but but I think it, going back to the work of Clive Thomas in the 1960s in the 1970s is very very important because that's all about looking at the resource base looking at what what people need looking at what can be produced domestically and just getting on with it um, and being in control of it so it's a, it's a question of again going back to the creation of a capital goods sector um, I won't talk about the Tanzan, Tanzan Railway. Suffice only to say that that railway was then supposed to ge generate an iron and steel complex. That's 40 years ago. Now there, there is, um, and Pascal will be able to, to enlighten us on this, there, is now, uh, uh, there are now reports that there is going to be an iron and steel complex built. The railway is being rehabilitated by, by China, and then there's going to be an iron and steel complex as a consequence of the resources that are available there. Then the question is, will the linkages be made? And, and finally, and this really is almost finally, um, we, we need also to discuss where is capitalism going? What is going on in capitalism? There's a very interesting book about to come out at the end of this month called Post-Capitalism, which is arguing that capitalism is already uh, beginning to show the, uh, and sow the seeds of its own disappearance. Uh, and this is happening through all kinds of activities that are bypassing the normal uh, channels of, of capitalism. And I won't go through that. Um, we'll maybe we'll have a chance of talking about that later. So my conclusions, agency is critical. Who's going to do it? Who's going to organize to do it? Um, an accumulating class. Uh, is that accumulating class, accumulating to consume or accumulating to invest? Uh, developmental state, the South Korea model, uh, Shivji's bureaucratic bourgeoisie, um, the Chinese kind of state socialist private capitalist model, new forms of social organization, which uh, mean either trade unions developing into different forms, uh, becoming much more social organizers, or new social forms of social organization assisting and even in some areas replacing what trade unions were, do, were doing. And then finally, a very interesting book that was published in the 1960s by two Americans who worked in Ghana, uh, Anne Seidman and uh, Reg, Reg Green, published a book called Unity or Poverty. And that was uh, essentially taking the Nkrumah dream of a unified Africa and, and arguing that econ the economics of that was absolutely crucial, that uh, you needed unity in order to generate economic development. And this goes back to the whole issue of pan-Africanism and of African cooperation and of the role of the African Union, and that, that links to the whole issue of delinking from the, the, world, the world economy as we now have it. Thank you and sorry to be over time. <laughs>